Hello, lovely people of York. How are we doing? Yeah. Have you all been reading your, your Odyssey in the interval, just like catching up? Yeah, yeah, all good. So it is my absolute pleasure and privilege to, to, for, for Say Out and also York Lit Fest because it's a, a collaboration between the two organisations to present this fantastic show. I first saw it, I don't know if you remember... Um, a year called 2019. It was um, it was a billion years ago now. But I first shot, saw the show up at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival in a tiny little pokey dungeon, um, and uh, I just knew that I'd love to bring it up to York sometime. Uh, a very historical city and a very historical story. Um, but I just want to say how excited I am to have Pete up bringing the show. Pete's one of those people where like you rock up to you, you know how you like, you rock up to anti fracking sites, yeah. Like, you know how you do that. And, like, you know, there's a load of crusties everywhere and, like, people blocking traffic and cops kicking off and stuff. And you'll just turn around and there'll just be a sound system and, and Pete will be there just, like, toasting on it or playing hip-hop music or just dancing or doing spoken word poetry. It's a bit like... It's a bit like a lighting a beak. It's a bit like Batman, but for, like, you know, like, protest movements, right? He's that sort of person. So, please, York, uh, can we get a little bit of stamping? A little bit of tapping on your tables, then start clapping, start whooping and wailing for the legendary Pete the Tenth Bidder! Henry Raby, everybody. Joy, the first thing I would like to say is, is hello. The second thing I'd like to say is joy. Joy to be here. Joy that you came. Joy that we are all together again. Hello, York. Lovely to see all your smiley little faces from up here. Um, so wonderful. So uh, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to make some noise with my face. And then I'm going to leave. And I can guarantee you will enjoy at least one of these two things. <laughs> So this is, welcome to Homer to Hip Hop. This is a people's history, or this is a, basically a history of the last 300,000 years of human beings speaking words. If you're a human being and you speak words, say, Ugh! Good, this, well, this one's for you. This is recommended for anybody with a face. Uh, this is also a, a radical history from Latin, rada, meaning root. So this is a, how people, a people's history of how people have, from the grassroots, have used verbal artistry to remake uh, the world, right, from the bottom up. And you're going to hear me talking about poets and oral poets and rappers and storytellers and singers and preachers and orators. And if you care about any of the, these professions, and how could you not, then this story uh, belongs to you. And I just want to calibrate you as an audience. We've had some fantastic warm-up already, but I just want to kind of like, just make us one body of people. The way we're going to do this is by uh, all doing something together, right? This is how you build a community, by doing stuff together. We're going to do something together. And I'd like you please to just put your hands in the air like this. Take a breath in and take a breath out. And repeat after me. I am a body. I am a body in a body. I am a body in a body. I am a body in a body of bodies bodying. I am a body in a body of bodies bodying. I am a body in a body of bodies bodying. I am a body in a body of bodies bodying. And just give your hands a little a wave around and just look around the room and see how it feels to be a body in a body of bodies bodying. This is an ancient uh, uh, sign language to say, I come unarmed, I'm not going to kill you, I have no weapons, I am open and I'm saying hello. Lovely, okay. Now you can put your hands, or you can keep them up if you like to. You can keep them the whole show, just do this at the back of the room, that's fine, I'm fine with that. Um, so what was that? Was that a gimmick? Was it a song? Was it call and response? Uh, was, was it, what was that? Uh, was it a poem? Well, by the conventions of the way that poetry is generally taught in our educational institutions, that wasn't a poem. But from the perspective of, uh, of, of, of oral poetry, which is what we're looking at here, that very much was a poem in the sense that it's a form of italicised language. It's high-impact speech. Okay, it's, it's a unit of speech that is made memorable, in this case through, you, through music and rhythm 
and it also takes risks with language. So it very much is a piece of poetry, and it's crucial to what we're talking about here. It takes risks with you guys, the audience in the room, and the audience in the room are the forgotten ingredient of poetry. And this whole family of, of verbal artistry that we're looking at, all the poets and the singers and the, or, and the orators that I've mentioned, all come under this umbrella of, of what's known as oriture, which is the oral spoken counterpart of literature, right? Or as I like to call it, gobshitery. <laughs> and people are like, what do you do? I, you know, I, I, I'm a poet and an author. No, I'm a gobshite. Let's, let's call a spade a spade. Um, so... Elasticating. We're elasticating our conception of what poetry is. And this is, this first slide is. Uh, uh, it's not, it's not, it doesn't want to come on. This is what happens when you leave your clicker on in your bag for a week. I'm going to have to come over this side. Hello. I still love you over there, but I'm now over this side so I can work my computer. This is a, um, this is a, uh, this is, okay, first off, this quote here from Paul Zumthor, beautiful quote, most poetic performances in all civilizations have always been sung. This is a fascinating quote. Um, most poetic performances in all civilizations have always been sung. And, and this makes sense. Before you have the printed or the written word, which is very, very recent, if you want to publish your words, you're going to make the most of the medium through which that poetry instantiates and substantiates itself, the body, the voice, all the thousands of muscles in your larynx and your face and your breathing apparatus. You're going to sing it or chant it. You're not going to speak it. This idea of, of the, re the, the reading or the recital, very recent phenomena uh, of a literate society and especially an academic culture. And I'm more into chanting and singing. You up for chanting and singing? Yeah. Good, we're going to be doing more of that. This, by the way, is a picture of a, um, of a flighting competition. Flighting is a, uh, a late medieval um, Nordic and Germanic uh, uh, verbal jousting competition where two verbal combatants will throw invective, invective so insults at, at each other. They're kind of like your mama jokes, basically. Uh, basically no different, in rhyming couplets. And the winner would, we, uh, would win like mead or maybe they'd win like a trophy or sometimes it would end in martial combat. Okay. Um, so yeah, rap battle, 13th century style. <laughs> this is a graph from my book. This is the most boring bit of the show, by the way. Don't worry about the, the, the lettering, the, the, the writing around the, the side. I want you to imagine that the last... 300,000 years of our history as uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, as a fully uh, developed anatomical envelope as, as modern humans. The last 300,000 years has been condensed into the last 24 hours. What a day! What a day! Oh my God! What a day it's been, and you're all looking really, really good for your age. <laughs> Only in the last 48 minutes has there been some people in some societies around the world that can read or write, and even then only a tiny minority. For the last uh, 43 seconds, and so it's now like 23.59 o'clock, last 23 seconds, there's been mass literacy. That's to say that there is some society, and again, only some societies, where the majority of people can read or write. And in the UK, that was the 1870 Education Act. 1870, that's really your great-great-grandmother ago, yeah? Very, very recent. Before then, most people in this country couldn't read or write. So when we're talking about the oral tradition, we're talking really about the long breadth of history, an incredibly important inheritance, an incredibly diverse and complex tradition through which, for the overwhelming majority of our history, we have... Uh, as a verbally mediated species, we have taught each other, communicated, passed on knowledge, and expressed ourselves. One of the great things about being human is that we have, uh, I would say, the most uh, complex and beautiful 
vocal apparatus of any, certainly of any mammal and, and arguably of any, any animal in the animal kingdom. We have a drops larynx, unlike other apes, which means that we can control our breath. And we have, as I say, thousands of muscles in our larynx and our pharynx, our facial musculature and our breathing apparatus, all dancing together to enable us to do incredible things with it. And so if you're having a shit day, just go, oh, well, I can speak. That's amazing. That's a miracle. Uh, an incredibly complex technology, biological technology, the human voice. We also have the technology of language itself. Harari calls it an information storage technology. Language is a magical process. Terence McKenna said, telepathy exists because within milliseconds I can take an image in my head and by some acoustic blasts of air these energetic transmissions, these waveforms that go through the air, I can create that image in your head within, within milliseconds. Right, so <clears throat> language for me is like a way that the universe and the world as it streams into our sensorium, as it streams into our, into our sensory kind of inputs, is a way that uh, the world transfigures itself into us and then we can represent the world and, and modulate consciousness of other people and thus uh, change the world around us. Isn't that amazing? If you think that's amazing, say I. Good, good, I'm glad you're with me. Okay. I'm gonna take a little digression here. This is a, a new addition to this show because I've just come back from Thailand where I spent uh, four months and I spent a lot of that time in Buddhist monasteries. Now, I don't wanna represent myself as some holy dude here, I'm not at all. If some of you will have been to Thailand some of you will have been to the monasteries there. Anybody can do it. You can pay a small donation and you get bed and board and you get to take part in the meditation activities. And I encourage anybody, if you ever do go to Thailand, to do this and to take part in this and, and to see, take part in this culture. It's really, really beautiful, really interesting. Um, the language through which Buddhist teachings have been passed down to us is Pali. Pali is a dead language. It's related to Sanskrit. It's a little bit like Latin. It's a dead language. It's the language of Buddhism. Okay, it's the, very similar to the language that, that uh, Siddhartha Gautama Buddha spoke two and a half millennia ago. Now, the oldest Pali scriptures that we have were written 1,000 years after Buddha died. And it, it, in fact, for the first 500 years of, uh, of Buddha's teachings, they weren't written down at all. That's to say that all of the thousands of what, what we now have as thousands of Pali scriptures were passed mouth to mouth by illiterate monks who would travel around northern India. Uh, and they had incredible memories because they were trained yogis. So they, they, they would train their bodies and their minds. And they had really good memories and they would pass it orally. It's an incredible oral inheritance. Many people believe that the Pali scriptures are the word of, of Buddha himself. It's very unlikely that verbatim word for word it is. However, we can be sure that it's, well, we can, we can say that it's highly likely that these, uh, this huge body of knowledge uh, uh, of Buddhist teachings were very close to the, to the images and the uh, metaphors uh, that Buddha himself were using. And the reason we can say this is because we can check these scriptures and we can compare them to historical records and we can compare them to, uh, uh, to archaeological records and other translations such as the um, Sanskrit trans translations into Chinese. And we can see that the historical incidents and the historical figures and, and many of the stories actually do match up. So it's an incredible feat that for 500 years, without the aid of, of being able to reference things with books and writing, that this massive body of knowledge, which is a huge part of what it is uh, of the Asian uh, phil uh, philosophical experience, was passed down through the oral tradition. Buddham saranam gachami, dhammam saranam gachami, Sangam saranam gachami, namo tasa bhagavato, aruhato samma sambuddhasa. The reason I'm able to remember these chants is because we would do this every evening. This is one of the monasteries that I was staying in uh, on the border with Burma. And why did, I've just realized that it says, I'm on 07566203852. I do not know how that has made it into this PowerPoint. I genuinely, I have no idea. That is also my number, um, which is both dangerous and inviting. Why it's there, I don't know. 
I didn't paint that onto the roof of the monastery, by the way. But this is the this is the the, uh, the monastery where we would we would meditate, and every evening so it was a silent meditation. We, every evening we'd come together and we'd chant. And I'm able to remem- remember these chants because we did them and we repeated it. And it also it has a melody, right? And the melody is like a, an earworm; it gets inside your head. And also we're all doing it together. And that means that we're synchronizing our breath and we're, synchro- and we're going through the, the, the meanings and the translations and the, and the images of, of these chants, of these, su- of these sutras, all together. And we're also synchronizing our nervous. This is called behavioral uh, synchronization. We're synchronizing our physiology by all singing together, right? This is an incredible uh, thing to do, actually. If you think about phenomenologically what that means to all be doing that all together. And also, you're not only syncing yourself to the people around you, you're syncing yourself to everybody who has sung these chants for the last two and a half thousand years. And that is a beautiful thing. And it is because of the oral tradition that we are able to take part in the most successful um, practical application of philosophy and psychology that our species has ever known. Um, in the form of the Buddhist sutras. This is a picture on the left of a North American, early 20th century uh, tribal elder. And this is a kind of archetypal um, European bard, kind of like pre-Roman Druidic bard, okay? You'll notice that uh, she has a funny hat on. I don't know her name. She has a funny hat on. I don't know his name either. Uh, He has a big beard and a big staff and they're both wearing funny clothes. If you are the elder, if you are the wordsmith, if you are the chronicler of of, of a tribal society, you're not just a poet, you're also a chronicler, a legal expert, um, and you're somebody, you're really the kind of the memory of the tribe, right? So which battles were fought and won? What land belongs to who? What needs sacrificing and when? Why the stars? Why the moon? Why should I listen to you tell me these things unless you've got a massive beard and a staff and a funny hat? This is really important. This is called artifactual communication in anthropology. The communication of artifacts to the communication of things. Very important. I'm a poet. I get to wear a wanky hat. That's part of my, my job role. Uh, I could have worn uh, a jeans and T-shirt. I didn't. I've got an... I've got this on because I'm trying to establish some authority to be here. I don't really know what the fuck... I don't know that. Yeah? Artifactual communication, really, really important. For oral poetry. This is a folk poem, a traditional folk poem from the Gilbert Islands of the South Pacific. That man came shouting, I am chief! He certainly looks lazy enough for the title. He also has the appetite of a king's son and a very royal waddle. But he shouts, I am chief! Therefore, I know he is not one. I love this. I love this. I love this. I love this. The verbal artistry of poetry is unparalleled in its capacity to praise and to curse. Okay, we're talking about modulating consciousness again. It's the ability to attribute worth or blame to something through artfully assembled language that makes this ancient craft incredibly, incredibly powerful. And that is why it's being used uh, right at the centre. It's not normal, by the way, that poets are, are are living on universal credit and need an Arts Council grant every three years to keep themselves alive. Actually, in most societies, we were actually really important. (laughs) This is a praise poet from West Africa. Um, I don't know the names of these people. They're from Senegal in the early 20th century. This is the praise poet uh, with his tribal chief. You still get praise poets, still very important part of many West African and other uh, societies around the world to this day. They're kind of like um, singing, all singing kind of PR machines. They would celebrate their chieftain and they would denigrate their enemies. This is another another quote from Paul Zumthor, my favorite scholar 
of um, the oral tradition. Oral poetry generally has more rules and more complex ones than the written form. In predominantly oral societies, oral poetry is often much more elaborate art than are the majority of our written productions. This is, again, a fascinating quote. Do you agree? Um, there is an assumption that all of us, I think, have to a greater or lesser de degree, that up here, you've got the high art of T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound, and down here, you've got your comedians and your spoken word artists and your rappers. And it wasn't until the 1960s that anthropologists started to visit um, uh, society, other societies around the world where you had stronger oral traditions and study what they were doing and finding out that actually, no, the exact opposite was true. Um, one key landmark book was this, The Singer of Tales by Alfred B. Lord, an English uh, anthropologist who studied the work of illiterate um, Slavic, former Yugoslavian uh, bards. And he worked out and he, and he cracked the code, he codified what they were doing. And this became known as the oral formulaic theory and he worked out how they were to, able to do these incredible feats with, without the use of writing. Now, it's not uncommon in an oral society for an oral poet to be able to memorize a poem of the equivalent length of 30,000 lines. That takes around about uh, 10 hours to recite. How do they do that, I hear you cry. How do they do that, I hear you cry. How do they do that? Oh, I'm glad you asked me that. Um, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna open the floor. How, how do you do that? And many of you could probably come up with some good guesses. Uh, what was that? The, the, I thought you said the bollocks then. <laughs> <laughs> the, the what, what? Mnemonics, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, great. That's uh, yeah. So there's this whole this whole sphere of of human um, endeavour, mnemonics. Uh, let's go further into that. How do you remember? What sort of techniques? More specifically, how do you rhyme? What one over here? Mind palace, yes, that's that ancient Greek rhetorical technique. Each room you go in, you visualize a, a mansion, you go each room you go in, it's got some really memorable image, and then you go around the house and then you remember each image. Is that the one? Yeah, brilliant. Anything else? Chinese whispers. Chinese whispers. How, elaborate. What do you mean by that? Ah, yeah, oh, they do. Mutation, yes, yeah, yeah, it, it, just allowing it to change. And, yeah, okay, I'm going to come back to that point in a minute. It's a really good, good point you've made there. Anything else? Uh, song, lines. song lines? Making it a song? Right, yeah, so you're using the landscape as a kind of... Um, <laughs> as chapter headings almost, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, great, great. That's an interesting one. I've not heard that one when I've asked this question. Thank you. Anything else? Repetition chorus. Repetition chorus, yeah, key one. Having a refrain to come back to. It's essentially, every, every, you know, a, a poem is a, uh, when you speak a poem, it's a score of music. So having that repetition, having that repetition coming back, it's a very common feature of oral poetry. Anything else? Asking questions. Asking questions. Was that just a, a comment at me? It's like, you're asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm answering a question. Yeah, yeah it, becomes a, it becomes a dialogue then, doesn't yeah. it? Right? I like that. I like that kind of like, it's almost like ping pong, where you kind of... Boop, 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 boop. You know, in certain West African traditions, they have what's called a, the encourager. The encourager is, um, is planted within the audience. And their job is to be, is to just be like, and they work with the poets. Their job to go, yeah, that's right, say it again. Right? <laughs> so you are my encouragers. I encourage, this I encourage of you. Yeah? You are my encouragers during this show. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's part of how the poem is published. All these really, really good uh, uh, answers, by the way, very sophisticated audience. Um, somebody mentioned rhyme earlier on. People always say that, really interesting. Um, rhyme actually. Uh, less so than you might think. Um, because if you've got a poem of the equivalent length of 30,000 lines, can you, ima can you imagine remembering the rhyming scheme of a poem that long? It's just not, it's going to be impossible. Now, there, now, rhyme is a part of it. It's part of the musicality, the rhythmicity of the poem. Okay? It's part of what kind of creates the river through which the, the poem rhymes. 
but not in the way that you might think. It's kind of woven in there, kind of like syncopated rhymes, early rhymes, late rhymes, yeah? So it's kind of part of the musicality, but it's not this kind of A-B-A-B rhyming scheme that you might get. You might be that we're, that is it really a symptom of a, of a kind of linear, kind of metric, um, literate society. So rhyme is in there, but not, uh, but not as we know it, Scotty. Um, what about something that's uh, like story mountain? Story, yeah, narrative, really. No, story sto mountain. A story mountain, no, a story mountain, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what is a story mountain? Um, well, it's, it's sort of when you climb up the top of the hill and come down, so um, what I mean by that, you have an introduction, you build the story, you reach the climax, and then the story starts to make its way down to some kind of a conclusion. That's interesting. A resolution, and it's called a story mountain. That's beautiful. I've never heard of that. Thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, it's used in primaries from like years three, years four up to help oh. children these days. Uh, so, are you a primary school teacher? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Story, <laughs> story mountain. It kind of links up to what you were saying about the storylines, right? Like that like idea of it, kind of like the, the, the narrative arc, almost. I like yeah. the name of it when you were talking like a stream, it's weeds. So. Yeah, nice. Story mountain. Okay. So narrative, really, really important to, to uh, musicality and story, two main devices. The, the, the rhythm, especially, the rhythm uh, will give you a kind of like, um, kind of like a scaffolding that you can swing through, that the story can kind of swing, that gives it a kind of structure. And the refrain, again, and the chorus line gives it that inter interactionism, especially if you're in the live context, really important to maintain the, the attentional resources in the room. Um, yeah, all of these really, really good. Basically, basically, we have now unpacked the all formulate theory. And by looking, once we codified this, we were able to look back at the oldest works of um, European literature, uh, that of the Homeric epics, uh, written by Homer in, um, in around about sixth century uh, BCE in ancient Greece. We were able to find, find out that actually Homer, in inverted comma, didn't write these. Actually, they were written by an entire society of illiterate travelling bards over the space of about 200 years. Um, in fact, most scholars believe that Homer now didn't exist. Homer means blind man in ancient Greece. Many, many oral poets were blind and they were revered because they had these incredible memories because they had to change their cognition because they were blind. So, Homer didn't exist. Sorry. <laughs> And today, the closest thing we have to an oral bard in, in our society is a stand-up comedian, a freestyle rapper, or a long-form storyteller. So that's a quick introduction to the oral tradition. And we're now going to get into the narrative proper. And we're going to look at the early modern period. If you're not a history buff, don't worry. When, when I say the early modern period, I'm talking about four or five hundred years from the end of the medieval period, so the Renaissance, through to the beginning of the industrial era, around about the Victorian era. Yeah, so this is, this is kind of like the making of the modern world. We're looking at Shakespeare through to top hats. Yeah. <laughs> and this is this period you've got the, 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 the agric agricultural revolution just leading up to the industrial revolution you've got the birth of ship, international shipping, trade, colonisation as well as part of this story the growth of education, literacy, start of universities basically the making of uh, international trade and finance the making of the modern world that we now live in the early modern period um, Let's get started. Hear ye! Hear ye! This is what we normally associate with. This, this is a town crier. Uh, before that, it was oyez, oyez, both of those things. That's Anglo-Norman for hear ye, or listen up, or yo, 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 yo. <laughs> and the town crier, if you, if, because remember, if, during this period, most people can't read or write. So, if you're in power, you need professional gobshites like this, uh, who can, um, announce royal proclamations, new laws, official announcements. Also, they would sell things. You could pay them a little bit of money and they would advertise for you, or they would do lost and found for you. They were kind of walking, talking, yelling, farting. Newspapers, local newspapers, very, very important. This is a classic uh, 
town crier, I think this is a, depicting from the 18th century with his bicorn hat, his big coat and ruffle, and his bell. Uh, artifactual communication again, very important. And together with the bell, this is a kind of, his voice is a kind of multimedia newscasting ritual. And this is a working class town crier of, in 1880, from the town of Rugby. Perhaps one of the last generations where the town crier had the importance that they've always had, because you remember the 1870 Education Act made a broad, a widespread literacy. So people like this would start to become much, much less important, but very important part of English, well, European life. And it wasn't just um, a bell that they would use in, in the Netherlands, it was a gong, in France it was a trumpet, in Italy it was a bugle, and the evidence of the official gobshite in the Bayer Tapestry, the belled proclaimer. Also in the hieroglyphs of ancient Egypt, we can find evidence of these, uh, of these people. It's something that humans do. They put on a hat, they get a big bell, and they yell at people on behalf of powerful people. That's what they do. Interesting fact about the English town crier, it's illegal. It's actually an act of, um, uh, it's an offence, a legal offence to the Queen to hinder uh, or heckle or, or injure a town crier whilst they're going about their work. So, if you want to get away with doing something illegal, dress up like a town crier. Just a suggestion. I've done this at the Bradford Literary Festival for an audience of school children and I advise them the same thing because it's part of a healthy democracy. Break the law, everybody, in a responsible way. Also, during this period, you have what's known as the ballad singers. And the ballad singers, what is a ballad, first of all? A ballad is a, a popular piece of printed literature, printed on one side, and the way that these would be sold would be through the songs of the ballad singers. They would publish them and they would sell them in public places. I may be a boy! Or a blind man, or a beggar. I may be a showman with money in my hands. I may peddle in the tavern, or in the marketplace. And verily does the tidings come flying from my face. The songs and the stories and the melodies and the poems that flew in and out of the mouths of the ballad singers wove together the life of European society for hundreds of years. They were part of the very fabric of our society. They were poets, they were singers, they were proto-spoken word artists, they were newscasters, they were singing magazines, they were buskers, they were beggars, they were all of these things in one. They were entertainers. This is a German ballad singer here with his PowerPoint. And remember, this is before the, the era of professional news, right? So news would come in the form, news and gossip, it would come in the form of poetry and song. And it would be asceticized news. It wouldn't be really factual news, very, very difficult, if you consider the difficulty, difficulties in communication. So it would be asceticized, it would be artistic, it would be made palatable, it would be memorable through the use of poetry and song. This is um, the uh, defeat of the Spanish Armada. Everybody knew that there were enemies in Spain and that, that this important uh, military battle had been won because of the songs of the ballad singers. <laughs> Idle youths, loathing honest labour and despising honest trades, betake themselves to a vagrant and vicious life in every corner of cities and market towns in the realm, singing and selling bad ballads. This is Henry Ch Chettle writing in 1592. Henry Chettle was um, a wanker. <laughs> Very often ballad singers were deemed to be vagrants and vagabonds, and their trade was deemed to be illegitimate, and they would be uh, rounded up and flogged or maybe even deported, along with the bear dancers and the cockfighters and the, and the minstrels and the jugglers, off to the, uh, to the colonies uh, as indentured workers. Um, 
uh, uh, so you really have to fight for your right to poetry. This is what this story tells us. And very often, uh, they, would, uh, they would circulate subversive songs and poems through their art form. You can very well imagine maybe in the tavern after, lock, lock, after lock-in, they'd be like, okay, now I'm going to give you a, a ballad that's not printed down. And they'd sing a satirical song about the local mayor or the king. Now, it was very dangerous in times of political instability to have gobshites on street corners. Still really uh, dangerous, as we're finding with the new legislation against protest, to have gobshitery at all in public places. If they're trying to make you illegal, you know you're doing something right, right, in in, in protest. Um, And severally throughout this period, the ballad singer's craft was made illegal. So, for example, during the English Civil War, uh, they were banned by Act of Parliament because they don't want people in public places uh, rousing the rabble. Throughout this period, scenes like this would become increasingly less common. Really important thing to remember about capitalism, and, and we're blind to this because uh, it's so it permeates the culture of capitalism. And, and work permeates our culture to such an extent that we're blind to what was there before. But the growth of of market economy meant centuries, and has been described by many historians, as a a centuries-long process of brainwashing an entire population to be disciplined, fastidious workers that don't take part in things like this, but actually... uh, save their money and don't allow their recreational pursuits to get in the way of their productive pleasures. This is called the Protestant work ethic, and we can see this in uh, common proverbs such as uh, time is money, uh, the devil makes work for idle hands, uh, or cleanliness is next to godliness, right? Uh, This idea that you should um, not do things like this, basically, and really the history of capitalism is a a, a state-sanctioned, centuries-long assault, not just on public revelry and, uh, and, and play uh, and carnival, but also on human creativity and the reason why you don't have enough time to read books and the reason why nobody feels empowered to call themselves a poet is because the idea that poetry isn't a real job has very, very deep historical roots. Throughout this period, you also have the witch hunt. Lasted for about 150 years. Many, many reasons why the witch hunt happened. But it was, um, in essence, an assault on an entire knowledge system. This is a cunning woman. Cunning woman is a fake, is a fake, is a folk healer. And these very feminine activities of ritual and ceremony and um, holistic medicine, the psychological elements of medicine, um, spells, charms, incantations, recipe poems, lullabies, were encoded into a whole oral heritage that was systematically destroyed through the witch hunt. Much of it encoded uh, pre-Roman pagan knowledge systems very close to the land, understanding the herbs. This is at a time of the rise of early pharmaceutical industry, right? So we're trying to suppress this. Um, interesting, the, the word witch is cognate with wit, so it denotes knowledge and, and wisdom and intelligence. Through this history, it became a derogatory term. If I was to say the word gossip, what do you think? What, 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 what does that word conjure for you, the word gossip? OK Magazine. What does OK Magazine conjure for you? Celebrities. Celebrities? Lies. Lies. Yeah, cool. So these generally kind of like negative, sorry if there's any OK Magazine readers here, but <laughs> generally kind of like the gossip is kind of frivolous, it's unnecessary, it's quite harmful. It's not real discourse, gossip. Interesting history to that word. Um, gossip is a contraction of godsib which is a contraction of God's sibling. A God sibling is like your, your, um, your godfather or your godmother or your goddaughter. 
So it's like a, a daughter or, 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 a, or a, sibling that, a sibling that is not by, uh, by blood. Now, your God siblings, they're your girls, yeah? So they're the people that you would come around your house and you talk about all the really important things that, that, that women talk about so that men don't commit suicide and, and cheat on people and stop being wankers, right? Gossip, very important part of how humans operate, right? Is it not? Um, and, uh, but it became, through these, the, this history, a kind of a, a negative word, right? Because if you're trying to create patriarchy and you're trying to create a division of labour where you have domestic servitude, you can't have female-to-female, peer-to-peer power. So words like that became negative. Now, it really is unknowable, the reservoir of folk wisdom that, w- that was lost to us through the witch hunts. And, of course, it isn't entirely lost to us because we can still reaccess this knowledge because it resides inside each of our breasts. I was once taught this um, folk poem, this folk song. Uh, it was given to me by somebody who was at Greenham Common um, anti-nuclear protest encampment in the 1980s. Who are the witches? Where did they come from? Maybe your great-great-grandmother was one. Witches are wild, wise women, they say. There's lots of witch in women today. Did somebody just say devil, devil? What did you say? Cackle, cackle. Cackle, cackle. Brilliant. Nice, nice. Got a witch. Any other witches in the house? Yeah. It's cool to be a witch now. People identify as witch. That's great. Isn't that wonderful? Also, throughout this period, you've got the enclosures, you've got land being taken by powerful people uh, to make it more productive uh, and more profitable. Okay? Um, that means kicking people off their land. Nowhere was this more tragic than in the Celtic fringe, places like Scotland, Ireland, Wales, the first wave of English colonialism. Uh, this is a Scottish community being kicked off the Highlands, and the work of the Scottish bards was deemed to be illegitimate. They were often flogged for practising their trade. Um, and really, if you want to destroy a people, you destroy their songs and their stories and their poets, because it's our stories which connect us to, the, to ourselves and to our history and to our land. And we're seeing this same process of cultural genocide against the social software of the oral tradition that made uh, this people a people. We're seeing this same cultural genocide rolled out on speed now uh, in any country that you go to in the global south. Also, we've got the rise throughout this period of the international uh, transatlantic slave trade. And I want to uh, contrast this haunting image here with this beautiful quote from the, uh, uh, the historian from Barbados, Edward Braithwaite. The slave ship be kind of, became a kind of psychophysical space capsule carrying intact the carriers of a kind of invisible atomic culture so that every African on those ships had within him or herself the potential of reconstruction. Beautiful quote, this. This idea that you can have absolutely nothing and yet you can literally be chained to the insides of a ship and yet through the oral tradition and the technology of the voice you can keep your culture intact and it can, it can survive and it can be carried to another continent. And we're going to see how this oral tradition, the oral traditions of West Africa would explode in the Americas later in the show. Many people, of course, were campaigning against this. This is one gentleman, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, a hero of mine, lived in Bristol, where I live, Um, came from Devon, Crediton, near Crediton in Devon, where he grew up. And look at him with his long hair, massive hippie. And he lived in Bristol, which is a big uh, slave port, and he would would campaign against the slave trade. He did performance lectures, became really, really good at it as a journalist and as a writer and as a poet. And he was so popular that, is there a fly on the, on the projector screen? <laughs> oh, it's like a little biological uh, uh, zoomorphic intervention into the history of, of Coleridge. So he would uh, do these performance lectures campaigning against, um, uh, against slavery. And uh, he was so good at it that the king and country mob, which is kind of like the BMP of their day, were giving him death threats. And he had to stop doing it for a while. And he was also a Unitarian preacher and would perform 
Uh, he traveled around Manchester and Birmingham, the north of England, performing to crowds of up to 7,000 people, incredible orator, incredible public speaker, known to us mostly through his writings, uh, such as The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner and, and Kubla Khan and other such poems today. So we're arriving now to the modern world. And it wasn't just slaves, and it wasn't just workers, and it wasn't just trades, uh, goods that was uh, traveling around on these ships in the Atlantic. It was also ideas. The American Revolution of the 1760s gave birth to the French Revolution of the 1780s. These ideas were carried on ships, pirate ships, traders, ports, London, Bristol, uh, Liverpool, etc. Um, so for the first time, Illiterate people were, were, were learning about international struggles, anti-slavery, the vote, uh, uh, um, democracy. Well, these things were radical concepts at the time. Um, uh, this is a quote from William Cobbett, who was a radical um, journalist and orator. We would have been familiar with this scene. There never yet was and never will be a nation permanently great consisting for the greater part of wretched and miserable families. And people would literally walk for miles to see people like this speak in the same way that they might go to church. And this is the lost art of political oratory. A political orator could improvise for hours on end. And they were very funny. They're kind of like stand-up comedian activists. They're incredible public speakers, speaking without amplification to large crowds of people. Uh, political oratory, dead. Now dead. <laughs> Boris Johnson, the tragic, the tragic conclusion of hundreds of years of political oratory. <clears throat> um, but the oral tradition still lives on in protest. If I was to say, what do we want? Justice. When do we want it? <laughs> what do we want? Justice. We have to think about that, don't we? <laughs> One, two people want justice. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. We're going to change each time. We're going to just keep up. What do we want? A succinct and informative rhyming chart that encapsulates popular sentiment whilst acting as a mnemonic device through the use of rhyme and repetition. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Justice. 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 That'll do, that'll do. What do we want? A friendly and policing strategy from the authorities and an adherence to international norms regarding preventative detention and basic human rights, such as the freedom of movement and the right to peaceful protest. When do we want it? Now! What do we want? <laughs> I did this uh, in Edinburgh once, and somebody in the back of the audience went, Freedom! <laughs> So we've now arrived to the industrial era, to what's known as the modern world, the last 200 years of human history. <gasps> Things are about to get um, steam-powered. And we will be returning to this history in 10 minutes. And that's a strict 10 minutes, uh, because we've got 250 years to get through. <laughs> so I will see you then. Goodbye.